is the fact that if manufacturing becomes more accessible, more people are going to are going to create more things. But you know, and, and and honestly, there's a lot of junk that's going to get created. I mean, that's what happened with 3D printers, right? They they suddenly you know you could get a commercial 3D printer for less than 1,500 bucks, and people were buying these things and making tchotchkes for their desk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and which which is great. I mean, you know, rock and roll, that's fun, but it's not um it's not it's it's not a not a part that you would you would spend time on if you were an engineer. Um, now, granted, when you when you turn to machining, suddenly you can make real parts, and now now you're able to create something that's a viable, sellable um, thing. But it, it adds that whole new element that, well, now I'm actually manufacturing. It's not just 3D printing. And now, granted, 3D printing technology is changing fast too, and and eventually, you know, there there is. Uh, subtractive manufacturing and additive manufacturing are going to get closer and closer together. Um, but even so, I mean, it's just it's it's all different types of of production that just the, I mean, ten years ago, well, maybe not ten years ago, fifteen years ago, if you would have told somebody that they could use additive or subtractive and not have to spend you know a few hundred thousand dollars in capital to make it happen. They, they would have told you you're full of it, you know, um, yeah. and, and now not only can you create those things in software fairly streamlined, right, but you can also now make the real part. I, I think that's I think that's the biggest thing about this whole movement in general is just it's 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 lowering the barrier and making everything available. Yeah, Chris. Um you know, I tell you what, I had a great time uh, when I visited your facility up there in Wisconsin. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was that a number of people attending your classes were actually educators. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, that, that entry point uh, for cost and value proposition. It certainly has seemed to open up this type of technology to more and more people, including students. And what shocked me was it was even at a high school level. Uh -huh. Are you seeing a lot of that? Is that really coming back? Are there a lot of high schools that are really, you know, looking at this type of technology and teaching it, you know, every day? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's, um, I, I, I think that's, that's huge. You know, I mean, the, the way, um, the, the way this stuff was getting taught, manufacturing was getting taught, was, you know, the traditional old school shop class, you know, and a lot, you know, the high schools that didn't have as much money, shop class was, wood, you know, some woodworking, so they had, you know, uh, a few saws, a drill press, and hammers and nails, right, and, right. Um, you know, when I, when I was in high school, it was like, well, everyone went through some sort of shop class, and then if you wanted to build a few more things, you know, you went on, you made a birdhouse and a box and, and some other stuff. And while those things are still important because it, it, it teaches that kind of, you know, the, the understanding of hands-on and working with different materials and things like that, approaching it from a true manufacturing perspective, you know, giving kids access to, well, I mean, our machines are great, but even like bridge ports and stuff like that, helping them understand that, Everything that's around you has to be produced somehow, and you know it was it was interesting actually when we were when we were flying out to uh, to SolidWorks World um, a couple weeks ago, uh, my colleague who's uh, uh, Jason who's one of our machinists. Um, if if you if you see any of the Tormach videos, it, it's it's either me I'm the the bald bald guy with the beard and Jason's the the other guy that's always on video and he's he's the one that does a lot of our cutting videos and stuff like that. Um, he was sitting next to a girl on the airplane who was um, pretty early on in college, and they got to talking, and uh, Jason came to the realization that she had no idea that all these elements inside this airplane, you know, that, that, that we were sitting in were machined, injection molded, and manufactured and built, and, and you know what I mean? Like, she just never made that connection. And and I think that's what that's honestly that's one of the coolest things about the um, the bastion of this maker movement is that 
there is kind of a separation um, for our younger generations. Like, I have a cell phone, right? I have a computer in my pocket that's stronger than the computer that uh, that flew men to the moon back in the 60s, right? And that's awesome. But the, the problem with that is no one questions what's inside it, right? It just works. This, as long as the software operates, it's great. And if it breaks, I just get a new one. And what's cool about this maker movement being more involved in education is that it's, it's showing that while that's cool, there is so much buried underneath that surface. And in fact, with some skill and, and a little bit of patience, you can actually build your own. And I think that's going to lead to the next generation of not just inventors, but just the next generation of, of truly innovative designers and engineers that can make things that we, we don't even, I mean, we can't even fathom at this point. Because if you would have asked me 15 years ago that I would have, you know, four emails and uh, Instagram in my pocket, I, I would have, you know, there's no way, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Hey, Chris, you mentioned a little bit about 3D printing and, yeah. you know, fantastic technology. I'm starting to explore it um, with my Tormach machine a little bit. And I've got a project coming up that I'm going to film that I'm actually going to use some machined or some uh, what would typically be machined soft jaws. Okay. I'm going to actually do those out of um, 3D printer and out of, out of some... Uh, some specific material that I'm looking at right now that can be kind of coolant resistant. I guess my question to you is, have you guys played with 3D printing in the area of, you know, adding value to your machine tools? Maybe even if it just came to fixturing or adding, you know, have you done anything with that yet? Yeah. Well, and that's, and you know, that, that's a really interesting thing. I've actually written a couple pieces um, about this because 3D printing, um, Many many people in the in the manufacturing space, not even in manufacturing, but just in the machining space, um, they they see 3D printing as it as it progresses as a technology as a threat almost. Yeah, and, and it's it's really not right. I mean, no. at, at the end at the end of the day, um, well, like you said, I mean, work holding is is huge, and I mean that's one of the that's one of the most interesting, if you ask me. And actually, in all honesty, most of the machinists here at Tormach, um, one of the most interesting parts about CNC machining is developing work holding and understanding that, like, oh, I have this part and I have to make it, but yeah. I have to hold on to it, you know. Right. <clears throat> and I, I and I think that's, I mean, 3D printing has an exceptional, um, or not exceptional, but an incredibly unique opportunity in that space. Um, we actually have a, a, a partnership with um, with Mark Forged, who does uh, they do carbon fiber um, 3D yeah. printing and stuff like that. And uh, they, we've got a set of soft jaws that they printed for us that we're going to use to um, show off exactly that because it's it is it is truly capable. But what's what's really interesting um, is stepping outside of like the traditional mindset of like FDM 3D printing with plastics is uh, the world of centering and, um, and, and I'm, I'm going to mess up the, I'm going to mess up the, the verbiage here, but it's essentially you're, you're, you're putting like a weld down like you would with an FDM printer, only it's in metal. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, we have a couple, um, a couple of our customers that are developing products, um, one of which the, the gentleman's name is Carl Ronka. Um, he's out in California, and he is has a machine agnostic um, apparatus that you strap to a mill, a CNC mill, mm -hmm. and it, what it what it allows you to do is essentially 3D print metal with this welding process, but it's um, the resolution isn't refined at all, right? I mean, it's it's just it it pulls away and it kind of looks like a rough lump. Of uh, of the the object that you're trying to to finish with, but because you're strapped to a CNC machine, then you you uh -huh. tool and you finish it right there. Yes. Yeah, so basically, he's using the servos and the capability and motion of the CNC machine to project a different medium. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that's yeah. yeah. 
that's pretty insightful and very inventive on his part. Yeah, and well, and and what's so cool about that design is that it's it's machine agnostic, which, right? It, you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter, right? I mean, like, as long as as long as you have a, uh, you know, you have you have his software to communicate with his unit, right? Right. The rest of it, like you said, it's using the servo motors and the machine, and then you you can use the same CAD file with the cam that you have for your machine after the fact, and then you finish it. And so rather than taking a, you know, a giant piece of billet, which granted is impressive, right? When you make a pile of chips and a giant piece of billet, it, it's fun, yes, <laughs> but, <yes>. right? <laughs> but, but it's a waste, right? And, right. and so what, what he's, what he's doing is he's taking these organic, um, very three dimensional shapes and you, you 3d print it and then you finish it off. And then at that point you have a, a final product or, or near final product. Sometimes you have to do hardening and stuff like that. But it's it's an incredible like hybridization of, of the two technologies. That's fascinating. And so, you know, we're talking a little bit about this this hybrid model. Is Tormac ever gonna look at that, do you think, a little bit? Or have you guys, you know, pulled back the covers on that and said, you know, we may go there someday. Well, it is it is one of those things. It's um, I, I don't I don't know if we'll go there someday. But what I do know is we love partnering with with folks like that, you know, um, and, and that's the thing. Like, you know, um, Carl's one of our customers, you know, and that's and that's where all of that kind of started is he he um, used our machine as like a use case. Like, OK, here's here's a small, affordable CNC machine. Mm -hmm. Um and he is one of our older machines, so it's got stepper motors on it. And he just he strapped this thing to it, and he was like, "Okay, I'm going to see if it works," and proved it out, and it, and it and it worked out great. And so now, I mean, now he's upselling it to much larger VMC um, type companies, you know. But he's again, the nice thing about his machine or his unit is it's it's machine agnostic. So. Right, right. You know, I, I would, I would, you know, we, we don't, we don't have any sort of partnership to like resell or anything like that. But we have, you know, we've communicated with him with on like the, uh, the ins and outs of some of the, uh, some of the technology and stuff because it's, it's really, it's an opportunity for us to expand our repertoire into seeing what people want, what people need in this space. And um, I think, especially in our space, because. Um, our machines are used a lot for prototyping and um, in like low end or uh, not low end, but uh, um, low quantity production. Mm -hmm. And that technology is perfect in, in concert with our machines because it's not about making a million parts. It's about right. making five to 10 good quality, ready to use parts. Right, right. Well, this this begs the question: Have you seen this hybrid model applied um, to other things, maybe like um, laser or routers, or you know, somebody maybe strap a plasma machine to the end of yours uh, to your machine tool? What have you seen out there? Yeah, well, and that's actually that's interesting because we actually have. Um, I mean, what's cool about being a a machine tool company that that you know, our market touches both professionals as well as hobbyists. Um, hobbyists, I mean, one of the one of the biggest things that they, or one of the things they spend their most the most of their time on, is making more tools for their machine. You know, yeah. and, and so we we have a lot of customers that'll mod out their machines. And now, granted, unfortunately, I can't. Um, from the marketing side of things, I can't show a lot of that stuff off because we don't, you know, liability reasons and stuff like that. But the the forums that are connected to our machines, I mean, people are making some amazing stuff. I mean, they're and, and like you said, and you mentioned lasers. We we have a customer up in Minnesota that um, did exactly that. He he strapped. I think I don't remember what he used. If it was a it was an old HD. Um, laser for uh, for like DVDs, mm -hmm. and and used a couple magnifiers and did a couple things, and then strapped it to the side of his machine, and he was doing engraving in or burning into wood, 
after he would engrave something. So he'd engrave it, but he wanted it to be darker. So then he'd go back over it. He'd shift his um, his coordinates over just ever so slightly to compensate for the fact that the laser wasn't in the middle, and then run it again, and then burn into those engravings. It was it was it's just it's amazing like how inventive people get when it's just like they have a, they have a problem and they want to fix it, or they have a have something and they want to make it that they they can do some incredible stuff. I haven't I haven't seen anything. Um, in the world of like the hybridizing, like with uh, like plasma and water jet or something like that, but definitely like the the laser cutters. Um, I have seen some folks uh, <laughs> strapping welders to uh, not our machines, but CNC machines in general, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it, it needs. Um, that's the best way to say this. It needs some refining, <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, but it's still, it's cool to see. I mean, you know, every, uh, every good idea starts in a garage. Well, sure. You know? And it's, it's predictable, repetitive motion. So it, it lends right. itself to that. Um, mm-hmm. Wow. Well, yeah, that's, that is awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, I mean, where, where that leads us, you know, I mean, I think, and that kind of goes back to, you know, what I'd said before about just this maker movement in general, it's, we're seeing, we're seeing people out in the wild, whether they're professionals or not, making more stuff. And when people are making more stuff, they're coming up with new ways, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's more efficient or not, Right. They're coming up with new ways to do stuff. And, and, you know, and I think that's what's so cool about about this movement being involved in manufacturing um, in in recent years is because uh, manufacturing for a long time kind of had this old stodgy personality. You know, um, it, it, anybody who's touched the world of manufacturing knows the the old you know, roughneck machinists, and there's nothing wrong with those guys. I mean, they they have a long history, and they they did some incredible work, but the new guard hasn't kind of come in yet, and so those old machinists are getting older, and there's there's you're losing that middle ground. But now, because that that bar for manufacturing is entering, you're getting younger people that are coming in, and they have no idea what to do because the the old uh, machinists are retiring or they're already retired and they're they're not there to to teach the old ways because the, you know machining has been around for a very very long time it, it's it's hard to come up with new techniques and new um new ways to do some stuff i mean i'm sure there's more ways to you know do a face mill or you know to to use a face mill or there's there's new ways to do um pocketing and stuff like that but at the end of the day you know it it's it takes yeah, a lot still, to come. Yeah, right. you're, yeah, you're still refined, really, to the physics of metal cutting, right? Right, exactly. So yeah, and and um, you know, every setup is different, um, and there's variables involved, rigidity, and all sorts of things, and tool, you know, tool protrusion, and the number of uh, flutes that you've got. But in general, it's it's kind of a known science. Right. Right, exactly, and and now granted, there are people um, and there are companies that I mean, they're continually refining that sort of thing, and and that's I mean, and that's cool, right? You you need that because the demands change and things like that. But you 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 know, if you look back at you take a big step back and you go to just entry level machining, like I said, that old guard isn't necessarily there to teach in the same way that the old guard had people to teach them, I and agree. so. Yes, and so and so people are coming up with new ways to do stuff, and like I said, they may not be right or the most efficient, but they're figuring it out. And then, and what that's what's great about the online communities that we see is then you can see that old guard come in and say, "Oh, well, yeah, do it this way." And suddenly there's this like there's this giant teaching moment without even without there ever any effort being put into it. It's just the old guard saying. This is cool. Let me show you a better way, <laughs> you know. And the the there's a hybridization in in thought process there too, right? Is people are starting to understand new and unique ways to do it, 
And so that old guard is learning as well as the new guard is learning the old stuff. And, and to combine those efforts, I mean, you, you really get to see how things are changing and they're changing fast. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. So you're out there quite a bit. You know, let's face it, we are doing our best here in the United States to bring manufacturing back to our home soil. And there's been a push, you know, for, for several years now to, to make that happen. What are you seeing out there? Are you seeing some excitement? Are you seeing some dynamics that this is starting to build again and get larger and larger? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think, and granted, I'm, I'm a little biased, right? Because I work at Tormach, but there is definitely a push towards the more I, I, I call it artisan manufacturing. Um, that that you know, pick and choose your term, but what it is is that the industry is growing, but the spaces are getting smaller. So you have smaller, younger businesses with less capital making parts that would would have been unheard of you know 30 years ago that you know th they would have never been in a shop that wasn't making more than a million parts so you're referring to the maker revolution that's going on a little bit essentially yeah yeah i mean because because what you're seeing and and, and like i said I'm, I'm a little biased because i work at tormach but the 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 folks that are making that are really succeeding are they're not i mean that the, there there are shops that are succeeding that have 10 million dollars in capital equipment or more right there are there are shops with you know a dozen giant vmcs and horizontals and and you, you, you know pick pick your giant machine tool but the businesses that are really thriving are the small ones that have you know two or three Tormach machines or you know a couple Tormach machines and maybe one VMC or it's just a small shop that they have maybe a manual lathe and and then a you know another another small bridge port or something like that because what's happening is you know our our economy has become that on demand economy there's yeah. there's there's such a want and a, and a and a and a hunger for um, customized, unique stuff, yes. and the the old school way. I mean, the old school method of manufacturing was you find a product that you know is is viable in a marketplace, and then you make a million of them, and that's how you you save money as a manufacturer by making a ton of them, and then you sell them for you know a, a, a commoditized cost, and the world gets basically a million different component or whatever, I mean, pick your number, of the same thing. The new wave is, well, we'll make a thousand of them, but then we realize that, oh, we could have we need to change this, and this, and this. So then they pivot, and then they start up a whole new manufacturing process and make their new part. And then, oh, we should have changed this other thing, or this can spin off into another product. And so then they change that manufacturing process and shift to that new thing. And that pivoting would have cost millions of dollars years ago. Now, because that manufacturing process is that artisan, right, where you're dealing with machines that, like the Tormach machines, where if it's not running, you're not necessarily losing money. Whereas if you spend, you know, great point. go ahead. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Yeah. Well, right. Cause so, so what happened? Yeah. I mean, like if you have a half a million dollar machine, if that thing, if that spindle isn't turning, you're not making money and yeah, you're losing money. Exactly. Exactly. Whereas with um, a smaller machine and smaller shops, that more artisan environment, you can make the parts that you need to make. You can sell them, and then you can pivot and make your parts better. So the iterations come faster, and this and this is why it works out for prototyping. But it really works out for like low low uh, quantity manufacturing. Is you can pivot really quickly, and then when you're when you're able to pivot, you can make better products faster and more catered to your customers. So rather than having a, a run of a million or three million parts, and you're like, well, this is what we're stuck with. Right, right, exactly. Well, 
And I think so, that's where a lot of people miss misunderstand stuff too, because um, you know I, I've posted some videos of my old dinosaur, and um, I've had some people come back and be like. Oh geez, the surface footage is so slow on that. You need to have a new machine and do this and this and this. And it's like, if you're the person paying the bills, <laughs> I can yep. I can afford a lot less surface footage at a lower cost of overhead and take a little more time to build that part than having a twenty five hundred dollar a month payment for a machine. And just right. because I have yeah. a $2,500 a month payment for the machine does not mean that my processes before the machine turned on are in sync. And I, I think that a big part of the gap, too, is, is when you start talking artists.